Hey everybody, welcome back to Open Baffle Basics. This is the third video that we've done now on this series. If you haven't watched the first two, be sure and check those out. We've been talking about baffle shape and size and width and how it affects the response. And we're gonna kind of pick up where we left off there and really get into the good stuff. I mean, today's the day I, I give away the farm. I'm gonna tell you why we do what we do and why it works so much better than a lot of the alternatives out there. Now, if you remember um, in the last episode, we talked about um, one of our original open baffle designs and then we followed some of those in an X-Series product line. We did an X-Static, which was a similar uh, upper structure baffle to this. It was an MTM and it had the soft dome tweeter in the middle of it. It was about this same width. So there were things that we had to correct for uh, to, because we had such little front to back wave separation so the crossover became a little more complex that was on the MTM section only. There are ways you can correct the response without um, having to add a bunch of corrective crossover parts or a bunch of digital correction. Um, the way you have to go about it, let's, let's just see, let's just see. Let's consider the front baffle uh, as this big piece of cardboard here. And what most people do is they get the great big baffle and mount their full range driver or their driver is just right in the middle of it. And that doesn't work well at all. What that does is you've, you, if you have a square baffle, you may have the same distance to the top, to the sides, and maybe even to the bottom. So you have the same amount of surface reflection on in every direction and you may have diffraction on three sides or four sides at the same frequency so imagine you had a 4k hertz peak a 4k hertz peak and another 4k hertz peak that adds up to a pretty large peak so what you can do is you can start moving the driver out of the middle get it over to the side and now you may have a edge diffraction or surface reflection area there that causes peaks in different different frequencies. So you may have one at, at 1k hertz, at 2k hertz, and at 4k hertz. So you have smaller ones but you still have them kind of spread out. Uh, the idea is to minimize all the surface reflections. Remember the bigger the baffle the more it's going to sound as if it's playing from the baffle forward. Uh, we talked about that with the Linkwitz Orion versus where um, the, the Mr. Linkwitz went with his later models where he, he wound up making almost a zero baffle which um, is a lot more transparent but requires tons of correction. So what if we take the baffle and we start to curve it a little bit? What if we shape the baffle so that it's not flat? Does that help? Yes, that helps a lot. It Instead of it projecting all the reflections forward it tends to spread them out and those surface reflections kind of go out evenly in a different dispersion pattern, which can really help a lot. What if we take those, this, the, the baffle and we fold it all the way over in so that we've minimized the surface area on the front to just the size of the drivers. That's great. And you're minimizing all that surface reflection and you still got front to back wave separation. This, the same separation that you had here is still present here. You just turned it into a U-shaped baffle. But now keep in mind this also causes problems depending on the frequency and wavelengths that are being played by the driver. If the driver you've got mounted on there's a low frequency driver only and it's just doing long, longer and low frequency wavelengths then this shape isn't a problem because the wavelengths are much longer than this area and they don't propagate within this area. So you're not creating a megaphone situation where you're getting a lot of compression there. Uh, the longer wavelengths just blow right by it. You've got the same separation as if it were flat. But if the wavelengths that that driver's producing start getting higher in frequency, the wavelengths are shorter, they begin to propagate within the space. And then they'll reflect off of the sides and start creating what's called a cavity resonance and it really disrupts the response and it can make everything sound very shouty and um, it's, it's quite the disruption. So you can't just 
fold it into a U. So what you can do is move the driver over to one side and then fold it back. So you make an L shape and you still have the same front to back wave separation, but it's asymmetrical. You got more separation on one side than you do on the other. And there's ways you can go about working with those links to really tailor this response. You can really change how the driver rolls off and how it reacts. And we've spent, oh man, hours and hours, weeks and months, shooting measurements on baffles. And at one time we even had a great big line source with a movable baffle. So the front baffle had a wing on the side that we could move in and out and find what's the best angle for the wing. You know, we're trying to achieve minimal amount of surface reflection, but still front to back wave separation. So uh, we kind of figured where the optimal is and it was just a little bit off square. Um, you can look at it from one end, it's, it would be a hundred degree uh, angle from the front baffle. And that still gave good front to back wave separation and worked out really well. I'm gonna show you on uh, a kit that we offered. This was the offshoot of the Anexotica. This was just a, uh, a desktop size model, you know, just an MTM that you would then set on your low frequency drivers. So most of the guys would use our 12 inch servo controlled woofers and maybe in an H frame or W frame. And then this piece would set on top of it. So we could just set it right on top of it and it would play down to about 160 Hertz. And you could pick that up then with the lower frequency drivers pretty easily. So uh, what we've done here, we've got the baffle and we've got a side wing that is pretty good size. That's creating some of your front to back wave separation. And then we tailor that even more with an additional side wing. So we've got a little side wing that goes on the other side. And then that front baffle just kind of sets in between them like, like so. If you look at it from the back, you'll see we didn't completely enclose it in. We've got a little notched out area here and there is a reason for that. And the side wing, the short side wing, plays a pretty big role in contouring and tailoring the response. This really helps create a little more than an L, but not quite a U. And you can adjust the response greatly just by the length of the side panel um, and the short wing. So you get a long wing, short wing, asymmetrical design. Now, keep in mind, remember a minute ago I said that if you close something in on three sides, like if this were to go all the way down, the high frequency that the tweeter produces will will easily um, cause a cavity resonance within that area. So you're, you're propagating those short waves real easily within this area. So it messes up the tweeter's response if this continues all the way down. Cutting a little scalloped area out of it unloads that area so that it's still a nice smooth roll off and it's not negatively affecting the response. So that's the reason sometimes you see around a tweeter you'll see an uneven shape there where you can't have a, a short side wing on the other side because it's enclosing it as soon as you enclose that high frequency it messes things it messes things up so this thing worked out fantastic you know it used a pair of our nq drivers uh, the planar magnetic neo 3 tweeter it's our version of that dg driver uh, is set in an inch and a half thick front baffle and the reason it's inch and a half thick is it moves the tweeter back in time so that it's physically aligned with the voice coils of the mid bass drivers and then when we design the filter for it the drivers are physically lined up so the, the crossover keeps the drivers in phase on the front side and then if you go around to the back side the voice coils are still physically aligned so they're still in phase on the back side. That's very important when you start doing tweeters that are completely open. If it's forward of the woofer, if you're just surface mounting it on the front, you may be able to configure a crossover that keeps them in phase on the front side. And then as you go to the back of the speaker, the time shift is such that they're no longer in phase and there may be a big hole in the response. So it's important when you start doing tweeters that are completely open that you start trying to align it with 
the um, the voice coil of the woofers. And then here on my right is another really good example. This is a little model we call the wedgie because it wound up just being a wedge shaped cabinet. It uses our little LGK drivers. They were called LGKs because they were little giant killers. And we had these made and we had a production run of about 500 of them done and they sounded really good. So I got this idea of putting them on an open baffle and matching them with um, the Neo 3 tweeter. And in this case, to keep the voice coils physically aligned, the front baffle just needed to be three quarters of an inch thick. So with the crossover on it, they're in phase on the front side. And as you go to the back of the speaker, they're again in phase. And this design of the short wing and the long wing created the front to back wave separation that made a perfectly flat response. And I didn't have to add any kind of correction or anything for it. And this one played down to close to 200 Hertz. And then of course it had a, a wedge shaped base that it set on that had larger drivers down on the bottom of it. So let's look at how I wind up with these shapes and why are they the, these links and what's going on, on there. Um, years ago, uh, Daryl Hawthorne at Hawthorne Audio, he used to do a series of open baffle speakers, sent one to me that was an eight inch driver with the Bama AMT tweeter and he wanted me to do the crossover for it. So it was on a baffle, told him send me a baffle just wide enough for the driver to mount on, for the eight inch driver. So it was maybe a nine inch wide baffle. And then I began putting the side wings on, different, different lengths, and looking at it and seeing what it's doing to the response. Now normally when I design something like these, I could go through hundreds of measurements of looking at different side wing lengths. I may cut a bunch out of styrofoam and stand them up and tape them on and shoot it, shorten it and lengthen it and look at what it's doing to the response and how long each one needs to be and get it close and then go make it out of MDF and then I may make two or three more out of MDF. So it's a long process. So if you think, hey, I'll just go put a side wing on and do another little wing on the short side and hey, I've got it. Chances are you probably don't have it. Um, it's, it, it makes a pretty big difference in the response. It changes it a lot and it takes, a, it takes putting a microphone in front of it to look and see what it's doing to kind of get a good idea for what's happening. And then you can tweak on that until you get a flat response. So let's look at what happened with Daryl Hawthorne's for him so he could see what's going on. I saved for him a bunch of the measurements and I sent it to him so he could see what was happening. Now, if you look on all these measurements that we're gonna throw up, there is a gray one in the back and that's, that's the woofer's response on the nine inch wide baffle with no side wings. So you, you, for comparison's sake, I left that on all of the measurements. So if you look in the background of the measurements, you're gonna see the gray response and it's humped up. There's a humped up area at 600 Hertz and at 900 Hertz where there's a little peak and then it just dies after that. It has no low frequency output at all, just And above that, you've got a drop in response and then it starts to level out and then there's some breakup at the top end. So that's on every measurement. Now, this first one we're gonna look at um, has the gray measurement in the background and the new measurement is in green. And this is with just a 10 inch wing like this on one side only. And if you'll notice, it lifted the bottom end of this range quite a bit. And it actually knocked some of the peak down and it smoothed it out a lot. Uh, looks a whole lot better than it did. Asymmetrical stuff works great. Then the next measurement you're going to see, this is in blue. This one is with a 10 inch wing on one side and, the, and a two inch uh, short wing. Notice again on the bottom end, how much it picked the bottom end back up. We're extending that bottom end. So we're taking that, that dipole peak that's caused um, when you do something on an open baffle and we're pushing it down in frequency in a range where it's naturally rolling off and we're lifting it with that, um, with that peak. So what we're doing is we're trying to create a perfectly smooth response. Um, looked pretty good. Now we added a four inch short wing and as you can see, it, it extended the bottom end a little, little more. If we kept doing this and we kept putting longer and longer 
um, side wings down both sides. We could get it to extend down a lot lower than just a flat baffle, but we get a significant disruption in the response. And if you look, um, it's the line in purple, and you can start to see some disruption in the response just above the mid range there in the about 600 to 1000 hertz. We're, we're getting some ripples. So too long of a short wing. Next we did a 12 inch long, uh, long wing. First measurement is with 12 inch wing and no side wing. And you'll see that in light blue. And you notice the response smoothed out quite a bit. We've still got a little bit of a peak right at around 1K hertz, but overall pretty smooth response. Next we put a two inch long short wing on the other side. You can see it in red. Now we're seeing what looks like a really good response. This thing is pretty smooth. Uh, this would take no correction whatsoever. Just put a passive filter on it. Looks good. Um, green line. Same 12 inch long, uh, long wing. We got a four inch long short wing. And as you can see, it extended a little lower. It picked it up at the very bottom, but there was a disruption again in the response just above that. Uh, we're getting some wiggles in the response. Next, I went to a 14 inch deep long wing, no side wing, no short wing. Uh, we see it in orange and it looks okay. It looks pretty good. We still got a little peak there at uh, around one K hertz, but overall pretty good. So next I added the two inch short wing to the other side and we see it in yellow. I know yellow is a little hard to see on the white screen, but it looks really, really good. Uh, that's a pretty smooth response. Uh, next we put a four inch long short wing on the short side. You can see that in dark gray. And as you can see, again, it's starting to create some wiggles there in the response. So not as smooth. So the best two overall responses that I have, um, I overlaid those and that is seen in red and green. And that is with a 12 inch long wing and a two inch short wing and with the two inch short wing and a 14 inch long side wing, uh, long wing on the other side. And both of those made really smooth responses. And I think what we really uh, decided on looked the smoothest was the 12 inch long with the two inch short wing. That made a great response. And if you look at the frequency response now of this, uh, once I was done, I blended it with that Bama tweeter we're at 97 dB sensitivity or so, almost 98 really, really 98 dB sensitivity. You could drive that thing with anything and it set right on top of uh, what the owner of that model that I did has. He set it on our 12 inch open baffle servo sub. So now he's full range, top to bottom. He can use one small amplifier to drive his upper section only. And you've got an open baffle speaker that you're not having to use a bunch of electronic crossover parts for. You don't have a bunch of surface reflections. It's super transparent. It's easy to drive. I mean, it's a winner all the way across. Um, and you, obviously you get a lot more transparency when that baffle gets really small. Like the little wedgie here, this is about as small as it gets. This thing's only four and a half inches wide. If you talk about transparent, this is one of the most transparent speakers I've ever heard. It's like, it's not there. Um, by the time it starts to get directional, you just, you can't tell because it's so, so higher up in frequency and then it's playing out both sides and it's within the room. It's just close your eyes and visualize a three dimensional sound stage. And when your baffle starts getting wider and wider, it goes away. You hear sound from the left speaker, you hear sound from the right speaker because there's so much reflection there. So I hope you guys. Hope you guys like this one. Uh, it may have been a little longer than I would have liked, but we needed to kind of cover this information and understand what's necessary in making those side wings work. So when you look at models like our NXotica or NXtreme and you see these long side wings and at the low frequency range, you see them all the way down. And as you get to the midsection, you don't see them all the way down and you even see cut areas around the tweeter. Now maybe you guys can understand what's going on and why it's designed that way. We're creating a flat response with the drivers before we even start putting crossover parts on it. So that keeps a minimal amount of parts in the signal path, like the network there on the wedgie, 
not very many parts have to be used. There's just five parts on the whole thing and it makes a perfectly flat response. So that's why we've gone the direction that we've gone. Uh, next week we're going to pick this up and look at low frequency drivers on an open baffle and look at flat baffles versus an H frame versus a W frame and versus a U shaped frame and we're going to talk about those pros and cons and hopefully you guys will get a little more out of that. If you haven't subscribed, hit the subscribe button. There's a little bell notification button there you can hit too and it will notify you when new videos come out. I appreciate the support and tune in again next week. Thanks guys.